Hi, my name's Theo Cook. I'm a teacher at Robins House Studio uh, Furniture School here in the UK. Um, following the interest of this Japanese dovetail joint that I created, um, I've decided to do a full tutorial of how to make your own. And here's the one that I'll be going through in this video. It's slightly simpler and stronger than the other one I created. So it goes together at 45 degrees like this. So there you go. I think this one would be, yeah, definitely stronger than the last one. And um, during this video, we'll be showing you how to mark it out, um, sawing, chiseling, um, what tools to use, and kind of, yeah, wood preparation and all the steps that you need to do. So the first stage of this joint is actually working out how you want to cut it. And obviously this is done on a piece of paper, just like this one here, depending on the, you know, the complexity of the kind of joint that you want to create. So for this one here, which is this example at the top here, with the Japanese joint, joint um, differs from kind of, yeah, any other joint that I know of really, that you have to use a template that goes off of your work. So it all starts from a center point here and kind of comes down. And depending on how high up this template is here or how thick it is here is yeah determines how wide the pins are at the top or how kind of small they are so this one's at 10 millimeters and this one's at 19 millimeters you can see the kind of difference here so obviously the closer you go to the surface the finer these pins become and obviously the more delicate they are so and they'll see these ones there's obviously more of them and then it becomes kind of shorter grain down here too and this joint here, you can actually, I mean, it it's very helps to kind of shade here because then that tells me which parts I have to cut and where. So obviously in this joint here, you can see the sycamore there, obviously are those three pieces. And then on the walnut here, those two pieces there are the bits that kind of poke through. And then it tells you where to kind of cut later on. And one of the kind of first things you need to do after you've done, you know, done this is then to prepare your wood perfectly to size, basically, and also to prepare your spacers. So these two guys are essential for this joint for marking out accurately. And the, this represents that 19 millimeter bits at the top there. And that's where the kind of center starts from, basically. I think it's this one, yeah, this one here. You can see that it's been scalped at the top there and that then follows down onto your work here this is then double side taped onto the top of your work and scalped down but I show this in kind of you know further images you know along the video after you've planed your wood to dimension width and kind of thickness extremely accurately and obviously both pieces I'd then move on to a shooting board or I would have shot the two ends of my stock or bits of wood completely square obviously in this dimension and that dimension before I do any marking and it needs to be yeah, extremely accurate and once that's done I then move on to the marking out blocks or the kind of spaces and um, this one here is part A, and this goes on the sycamore bit here. And this one is 19 millimeters. And part B, which goes onto the walnut, is 19.3 millimeters. And it's essential that you make these bits of wood this 0.3 millimeter thicker. The point starts obviously from the top here, and the point starts from the top of this one here, just from the you know, shown from the kind of drawing. And the reason why this one is slightly thicker is that the point start, starts slightly higher off. If I kind of raise this up, you can kind of see it. If you raise this higher and higher and higher, it would spread those two kind of out wider. If you did it exactly the same 90 millimeters as that one, this joint would just be very loose. It would just kind of fly straight in there. You would need a little bit of kind of tightness. That 0.3 could change very slightly. You could do 0.2 if you found it too, yeah, too tight or, 0.4 if it was too loose, but I found that 0.3 seemed to work quite well.
One thing I forgot to mention earlier when you're marking out your dovetail is this this kind of ghost line here on the drawing, which is yeah very important and doesn't mean much and on this, but then when you look at the joint here, that represents this path here, and you don't want to forget about this basically because if you if you don't do this you because it look better obviously if this spreads over here it becomes more you know these become more kind of even but if you spread this over here and that kind of shoots out of the side here then obviously this joint will protrude from your side and this is one of the things that I learnt when doing this dovetail here that it actually shot out of the side here and you can just see it there which I wasn't very happy with at the time but from the top you can't really see it and I didn't really, yeah, didn't really realise that, yeah, that at that point in there, obviously shoots down at the same angle as this one here, so it kind of pops out the pops out the side there. So when you're actually working out your joint, it's very important, as you can see it on these guys here, that you draw on your. It obviously goes up at 90 degrees here, and then goes down at the same angle. This one goes down here. You can see it there too. So 90 degrees up. That dimension there just follows on down there and that's where the bottom of this joint will kind of yeah will kick out at basically and then once you kind of yeah obviously with that knowledge it's then time to kind of stick these spaces on the top here stick that to the top of there in the middle and then stick the top of this one here in the middle and the first tools you need the sliding bevels and depending on the number of joints here well this one is only got so the number this is a number one so this one you'll be needed to cut or to scalpel down here and scalpel down here and over the tops as well which I'll show you when I just kind of take these off and obviously for slightly more complicated joints I've got well I've got four or five sliding bevels but for a more complicated one like this you will need four different sliding bevels all set up because you can't interchange them. You don't want to kind of take the set off basically. So the number one, it's obviously a mirror. So the number one does this one, this one, and all of the rest of the kind of, you know, angles at the back here afterwards. Obviously you need, yeah, four in total to do this one, but you need two for this one, which I'll show you. You then obviously set, so number one is then set up here from the center point here down to where you want it to go down here and then obviously lock it off extremely extremely tightly because you don't want that to shift anywhere along when you're kind of marking out and then I would label them up as well so it's labeled up as number one and you write on your joint here the numbers that correspond with your kind of original drawing so you don't get yeah don't get confused at which one you're doing if you have you know you know total of four or more and then you set up sliding bevel number two to the angle of number two. And I show this further in the in other, you know, the video after well, you know, a few clips after this one, I show kind of more in-depth kind of stills and things like that of me actually, you know, cutting this this joint. Obviously it's cut now, but I've obviously made lots of videos of the kind of marking out and the scalping and so on and so forth. But then once you kind of scalpeled down here, this is a swan kind of scalpel that I use to scalpel down here. So you scalpel in here, scalpel down there, scalpel, you know, all of the kind of front kind of joints. And once you've done that, you pop these off. Obviously there was wood here before and obviously using your number two gauge, you would then gauge this line here and then obviously it would then be go down the back here too so whichever one it's been used if it's a number two it's this whole plane is then done with a number two sliding bevel and the same thing applies with the number one it's everything on this face here is all done with the number one bevel and obviously then mirrored over the other side
I just wanted to um, talk about some of the tools that I use to um, yeah to cut this joint and I use and around the workshop obviously I mentioned the kind of yeah sliding bevels pretty you know pretty essential you know fairly kind of inexpensive kind of tools really yeah as I said I've got quite a few yeah quite a few of these and um, obviously kind of engineering you know kind of engineering squares digital calipers an essential yeah an essential part of the toolkit really um, I see a Veritas marking gauge which you see you know later later clips again extremely yeah really really kind of amazing tool because it obviously has a flat kind of tip there yeah really kind of accurate marking out and um, so for when I mark out my dovetails and lots of other dovetails, it's with a kind of scalpel with kind of replaceable, yeah, replaceable tips here. Nice and yeah, razor sharp when you need it to be. And also I have a kind of array of handmade, you know, chisels and things that I've kind of made myself, you know, during my kind of many years of you know making furniture. And lots of these have been kind of yeah, sanded and manipulated to be very kind of skinny and kind of small at the top there. Because when you're doing, you know, dovetails like this, obviously your chisel has to then fit in between, you know, the tip here. Obviously your standard kind of, not necessarily a Japanese chisel, but obviously it's very fat at that top. And it won't, yeah, won't fit through basically when you have to pair, you know, pair inside here. So yeah, you really need to have skinny, I mean, even this isn't skinny enough for some of the kind of joints. Also a nice little chisel for um, when you've kind of, you know, cut this joint, you sometimes need to, because they're, you know, sometimes they're super, super tight and you don't need them to be tight inside these kind of, you know, all of the inside of these faces here. So I use this chisel, which is slightly concaved. It's very hard to see if I get my, if I get my square on it here. It's got a very slight kind of, very slight curve to, you know, very slight kind of curve to it there. So thereby I can go inside here and pair, you undercut the kind of joint here. So the actual tips, you know, around this kind of edge there are the most important really. Other kind of little tools that I use and you'll, you'll see that along the other kind of video clips to do really, really crisp joints is, you know, Obviously you've got to scalpel these joints here, but to do the final, final fitting, I like to, I put a bit of um, sticky back sandpaper. I put all, you know, description of, um, obviously, you know, not chisels, chisels are chisels, but you know, the sliding bevel and other kind of, you know, other, yeah, other tools, you know, I'll put in the description so you can kind of find those for yourselves. Also this um, sandpaper is really useful. It's some um, sticky back sandpaper, it's called PSA back sandpaper that I stick on to kind of, either you know tools or rulers or whatever it may be to do the final kind of sanding of these because once you you know to get this really crisp with a chisel would be yeah pretty hard you've got to get you know 90 percent there but the last kind of knockings you can see how kind of flat flat it is in there would be done with this uh, very very carefully this is 320 grit so you do tiniest tiny sanding inside here and you do that to all of your joint surfaces on both of your parts and that just makes a really really nice you can't do it much obviously You've got to be careful but um yeah it makes for really nice crisp sharp edges and obviously then you know when you finish sanding when you can't see any kind of yeah any shadowing in there basically
one of the things I'd like to mention when you're when, when you're trying to fit you when you're, once you've you know, scalpeled everything and you've you know cut and chiselled everything, if your joint is too tight or you're having kind of problems putting it together, it's one very important thing you've got to remember is that this joint obviously goes all the way through and it has to start off unlike other joints where it kind of you know just fits together kind of you know 90 degrees or what have you because this fits together at 45 degrees these points here have to enter the top here and then obviously have to come through the bottom here so you've got to really bear that in mind and the same thing goes with these points here and here end up up here. So if you find this joint doesn't fit at the top here, you've really got to be careful because you've got to think, if I remove something from here, will I make it loose here? So you've got to constantly, while kind of trimming and checking to see whether things are tight, you've got to reference, you've got to put this joint touching it like this to see whether that's going to fit okay and similarly putting it together like this to see whether it's kind of tight actually it works better but yeah kind of that way round whether it kind of fits tight there and equally this one fits kind of nice and tight there that's why I like to kind of slightly undercut it like I said before you know in here in these kind of you know in these kind of faces here because you you know there's no point in it being tight you know all the way here when it really doesn't need to i'm not talking about massive undercutting but a small amount of undercutting here so if it's tight anywhere it's right on these kind of outer these outer edges and on the tips here basically to kind of yeah so you just got to bear in mind exactly where it kind of pokes you know where it pokes through and not to take it off in the wrong places but if you've marked it out extremely accurately with your scalpel and with the two you know with the kind of a and b templates and really kind of paid attention with your kind of bevels that you've scalped it in the right direction then it should be you know should be pretty good before i um glue this joint up i thought i'd like to mention that when you're kind of doing the marking out stage of this shoulder line here that you do it slightly under the dimension. I don't know if you can kind of see it here, it's quite, yeah, you can see it just about there. So when you clamp this up, unlike other kind of dovetails where you have this protruding and then you just kind of clean that off, that'd be a lot easier. But it's quite hard to put pressure on these kind of small pins, especially if you have more delicate or more kind of, you know, finer pins like, like this guy here. I really struggled kind of clamping this up with yeah with the really small pins yeah really small pins here so I decided to mark mark the kind of yeah slightly under under the dimension there and this is done with when you're doing your marking gauge here for the shirt for this shoulder line here when you're going down to there basically that you set your marking gauge up to just under the thickness of your kind of yeah of your stock or your material basically and that means your pins won't poke yeah won't poke through there which you'll see just now when I'm kind of gluing up so it helps a lot really and also make sure you've waxed your waxed your blocks here these have kind of yeah been pre-waxed so we'll see they won't because they'll still stay there obviously during the kind of clamping process and I've done them just under the kind of yeah that kind of width there so I can see that the pins here kind of yeah close down and the glue I'm using is tight bond, yeah, just regular kind of original, tight bond original. And some sash clamps. cheeks here really a bit on the end grain
squeeze, take off some of the excess. There we go. side to allow the other one to clamp as well. Seems pretty good. Okay, see how that turns out in a bit. Right, glue up went quite well, I think, and um, yeah, I planed it all up and flushed all off the surfaces there, and um, yeah, sanded it quite thoroughly, and um, gave it a coat of oil. The oil that I used is this. Um, yeah, Osmo, what's made by Osmo, Satin Clear, it's a kind of, yeah, one of the go-to kind of finishes we use here. Similar to kind of Danish oil, but it's a bit more kind of hard wearing. You want to do about two or three coats, yeah, two or three coats of that. But yeah, pretty happy with the results. Um, so yeah, hope you liked the video. Um, if you're interested in the school or doing kind of courses here at Robson's House Studio, then please see the kind of, yeah, website link below. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy making your own Japanese dovetail joints. And if you'd like to see any other videos and um, my other video of that, yeah, that one kind of going together, not as in depth as this one, but yeah, hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much.